John, what has it been like to be back on this campus and getting the reception that you have received? It's been tremendous, actually. I, again, I, I keep on saying this, and although I don't like to be wrong, I did underestimate, especially being on campus, not specifically here, but being around a lot of young people, um, very mainstream. Uh, I expected it to be a bit, if not openly hostile, um, I expected it to be a bit standoffish, and it's been the exact opposite. People have been coming up to me, all kinds of people, everywhere I go, uh, and it's been, it's been really heartwarming, actually. Yeah. You've always been opinionated, and I remember you and I having some interesting talks when you played here, because you would always give me, as I refer to as the European perspective. <laughs> and I would give you the American perspective, and then when we were done, you were right. <laughs> That's about right. How important has it been that, that you continue to speak out on issues, to talk about things that not just are important to you, but that, you are, that are important to society and youth? I think it's vital. Anytime you have a platform, um, that's an opportunity. And it, not just an opportunity, an obligation uh, to speak out, but not just to talk. I think there are far too many people out there who just flap their gums because they can. I think when you have this position of, um, of power, this position of, and a presence maybe, um, you've got a real responsibility to speak eloquently um, and to have a lot more knowledge behind your thoughts um, so that you can enlighten people, um, so you can challenge people, you can um, try and change their perspectives um, and bring things that are murky yeah. into some kind of perspective. One of the people I had the privilege of meeting and at least a little bit knowing your mom mm -hmm. and meeting your sister as well. Yep. How much did she instill that, that feeling in, the, in you that you should seek perfection, that you should speak out on issues where you see a need? Uh, she was, in terms of my formative years, she was it. She was the role model. She was the mentor. She was uh, constantly modeling unbelievable great behavior. When you look at, you go to Vanderbilt, then you and Matt Maloney mm -hmm. decide you're going to transfer to Penn State. Matt stayed here a month, you stayed three years. Mm -hmm. uh, how dramatic was the transition for you from the Vanderbilt atmosphere to the Penn State atmosphere in both basketball and also campus personality? Uh, completely different. I mean, and part of it was my fault mm -hmm. because on Vanderbilt's campus, I don't think I, it was only my second year in the country. Were you too young? I don't know if I was too young, because I always felt that I was kind of old right. for my age anyway. Yeah. But it's not that I was too young, it's just that I was too new to the country and I was just feeling my way. And on Vanderbilt's campus, I got there and I couldn't understand what people were saying, right. never mind anything else. Um, so I just didn't get as involved. And the basketball didn't go as well and the coach didn't understand me and the academics was tough and, mm. uh, and I didn't get the academic advice that I needed, that more, prob more probably. Um, so. I kind of shut down. Well, I got to this campus and all of a sudden I had academic advisors who helped me navigate things so I knew I would be able to do well and excel in the subjects that I needed to. Um, and then the basketball. I had a coach who promised me nothing right. and yet at the same time expected the world. He expected me to work hard, he expected me and he knew that with this approach he would be able to pull the basketball player out of the shell. Right. Um, Talk about Bruce. Yeah, Bruce Parker. Bruce Parker. And people don't realize, and this is something where, because it, when you end up broadcasting somebody, every game somebody plays, people don't realize for your size, you have size 13 feet, mm -hmm. if I remember the number yep. right. The number right? Yep. So you needed to learn balance mm -hmm. here. And how much did Bruce, Jerry Dunn, Ed DeChellis help you develop as a basketball player? They, I mean, they were tremendous. You know, I'd had a really good high school coach who helped me out. Um, then I went to Vanderbilt and I had a year where almost no individual attention at all was paid to me. And then I went to Penn State where even as a red shirt, individual sessions with, with Ed DeCellis, individual sessions with Jerry Dunn, and individual sessions with Bruce Parkhill uh, allowed me to you know, exponentially improve my basketball in the course of that red shirt year, leaving me ready for the Big Ten the moment it started. And I don't know how many places I could have gone and had that kind of attention. Yeah. Now here's the next part, another name that maybe a lot of people don't know, but we know, Sandy Meyer. Mm -hmm. How much did she expand your academic horizons and also expand your horizons that you were going to be more than just a basketball player, you were going to be an intellectual that had something to offer? Yeah, I think the best part of Sandy, I can honestly say that my mother would never have allowed me to come to America and just been a basketball player, mm -hmm. never. I mean, she called constantly mm -hmm. um, on me 
to be excellent in all the areas of my life. The difference was when I came to Penn State, Sandy Meyer was somebody who was like a kindred spirit in that, and it didn't seem weird. Yeah. You want to be good at, you know, at other schools, you literally, athletes are, are questioned, why would you want to you know, just get by in mm -hmm. class and worry about your sport? Whereas here, she wanted me to excel, and that was, that was what I needed. You know, and, and not just in the academic subjects. I mean, I would, we would, and it's just kind of geekish, and I hesitate to say this, yeah. but I would go to her office, and you know, once a week, we'd flip through the dictionary, and we'd find a, a word, and we'd just learn a new word. I mean, the first word I ever, we learned together was um, syllogism. There you go. But anyway, once but again, we did that. Your humble host is at a loss. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was unbelievable to find somebody who actually wanted to take part in these activities right. with me. Mm. Uh, it was very encouraging. Loyalty, uh, I've known you, what, 15 years? I know loyalty is important to you. Mm -hmm. Did that come forward in the Orlando Magic Laker negotiations? Mm -hmm. Because you could have been Shaquille O'Neal's, quote, backup mm -hmm. for Big Doe, and you stayed with Orlando. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, because I speak a lot about being a person of principle. And... Uh, there's a lot of people who do that because most people know that they'll never really be tested. They'll have small things where they have to make tiny sacrifices and they'll look great. But most people will never have that thing that comes along that is, that is so massive mm -hmm. where somebody essentially will offer you everything you ever wanted in the palm of your hand and you, because of your principles, will have to say no to that. And uh, I've never wanted to play for a team more than I wanted to play for the Lakers. I've never wanted that kind of money more than I wanted. You know. <laughs> it was great. Right. It was everything I wanted. L.A. weather, right. you know, kind of the glitz of the whole yeah. thing. Playing with a team that you knew was going to win, with you or without you. Right. Guaranteed three championships during that seven years, at least. Right. And they did. Um, but the year before, nobody had wanted me. Mm. And Orlando came along, and they gave me a chance. A 15 grand guaranteed contract right. I had with Orlando. Yeah. But they gave me a chance. Yeah. And then the next year, 17 teams came along and, and I, Orlando asked me to stay. And that's what you do. You reward people's loyalty, but you don't act in a principal fashion because you believe everybody else will. Yeah. I knew there was a good chance that I would get shafted. Hmm. And I did. Hmm. But you can't be a part-time man of principle. How difficult was the professional side of the NBA to deal with? How difficult were the attitudes of the NBA to deal with? Um, I think there's two elements to this. There's, a, there's the fact that I think a lot of, there's a posture that is assumed by NBA basketball players and by elite athletes in general. You're supposed to be this tough guy who's not sensitive, who is mildly misogynistic to very misogynistic. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be homophobic. You're supposed to be any number, you're supposed to spend money in you know, ridiculous ways. Um, all these things, there's a posture that you're supposed to assume. And people do it as a defense mechanism just so you fit in. Mm. And the fact is, I was on teams with just great people. And yeah. some of them assumed those things. But when they realized, eh, John's a bit different. He's English, he drinks tea before games, he reads books, he writes poetry. It just became what John does. Mm. And it was never an issue. Mm. Um, though outside of the team concept, you knew that they still had this posture that they took on. Yeah. Uh, I know whenever I've been on talk shows, I've always told them that when you get John on the show, ask this question. So I'm going to ask the question, what are you doing with the money from the book? Mm -hmm. Because I already know the answer to the question, and that is you are? Uh, I spent it all on an Escalade. <laughs> <laughs> if that ever happens, that would be, blow my mind. That is the quote yeah, for yes. life. And, the, uh, well, I mean, the it's, fact, it, it's all about youth, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it's all gone. Uh, I have a charity in England, and uh, frankly, its budget every month in order to build, you know, I build community centers that cost between seven, seven and a half million pounds. The budget every month is in the region of 100,000 100, pounds. Mm -hmm. So any money from the book um, is gone. I wish I was JK Rowling's. I wish <laughs> that I got a seven million pound advance. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to advance my, my cause in England and do the right thing in America as well. You've also had to deal with the national media on, on this. Mm -hmm. Have you run through some questions that when you're done, you just went, what did I just deal with here? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, I, I think part of my role has been to educate uh, the media, to educate yeah. journalists. 
Uh, my first interview that I did started off with, how many times a week do you have sex? <laughs> do you use a condom? Yeah. Are you HIV positive? Right. That was my first interview, yeah. which is interesting and very short. And we're off to a good start. Yes. But part of my role is to educate. When, uh, when a journalist says, talks to me about sexual preference, it's my job to say, no, it's sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Not because it's a, a, you know, a flippant kind of word game, but because it's important. The words people use are important. Mm -hmm. And it's my job to let them know. In every atmosphere, we have to strive to be perfect. Mm -hmm. In the world of diversity, and diversity is not just a single subject, it is a multitude of subjects. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what does society whether it's Europe or America, have to do to strive to be perfect? What do we have to do better? I mean, there are simple things, which is the breakdown of fundamental respect and um, a dearth and an almost complete lack of empathy for people who are not like you are. Mm. Um, it shocks me when people say things like they, they, only, they only started talking to black people when they're their son married a, a, a black woman, or, or they only started to care about the plight of you know, gay children in school when they realized that their child was gay. You know, empathy has to come from, it should be the root of humanity. It should just be, I want to be able to connect with other people around me and, and feel not only their joys, but their pain as well. The heart needs to dictate the mind. It, it doesn't even need to dictate it, but it should be in there. Right. It shouldn't just be a, you know, because you want the heart, but you also want to have an intellectual conversation mm -hmm. about this because a lot of times the, the reason that people don't like minorities of all different kinds is a very knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. You know, black people, they're all predatory and stupid. Or gay people, they're all predatory and something else. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, a lot of it's a knee-jerk reaction. So you need to have a, an intellectual conversation about it too. Do you have trouble finding forums for that kind of intellectual conversation? And has the book opened up the door for that intellectual conversation with you helping to lead it? Yeah, the book has certainly helped because um, it puts me in lots of different forums um, to talk to people, which is great. And the good part is that uh, I'm getting pretty good at this game now. Yeah. So yeah. when people ask certain questions and they aren't what I want to talk about, you have to bridge it into something yeah. that you do want to talk about. And there are interviewers who just want to say, well, what about you in the locker room? And, and then you say, well, let's talk about the workplace issue. It's not really a sports mm. issue, it's a workplace issue. And you kind of move it away from the groin mm. and into the brain, and that's what we want to do. Right. And that is a workplace, right? Exactly. You know, John, always a pleasure, appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.